Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank again everyone for having me here. I'd like to a special thanks to Costa for giving me a topic that he knows much more about than I do. But uh, we'll uh, we'll go through it. And I think it's important when we talk about some of these techniques that many of us in this room will never use them but we should be aware of them because maybe in certain situations they should be assessed by someone who may have competence, experience in these uh, situations and, and the patient should be looked after by them. Okay, so TAVI we know in today, today's TAVR is very predictable. Uh, and I say that most of the time. We take our time um, initially screening patients with echo to ensure that they do have severe AS. And then uh, with CT imaging, uh, annular sizing, vascular access, other imponderables, we look at the, the whole uh, annulus area, the sinus, the sinotubial junction, the LVOT, looking for calcium, looking for size. And this is something that we never did in the early days, but very important. And um, because of this predictability, 90% uh, of TAVI is generally done skin to skin within 30 to, to 60 minutes. And it allows us to do, uh, be very efficient and uh, get our patients home early. Um, there are, uh, valve and valve is a special situation which can be very, sometimes the quickest procedures, but also sometimes uh, the most unpredictable and longest ones. And uh, we need special care. And uh, I do worry when everyone thinks we're going to be able to do valve and valve in the future in every single patient, because that's not going to be the case. Um, especially, uh, my preference is to send uh, aortic stenosis, if they go to surgery, to a surgeon who is experienced in aortic valve surgery, and they do a root enlargement. That actually may make it harder to do a valve and valve in the future, although the initial outcome will be much better. This is when it gets real. And we've all had this situation, I think almost all of us, uh, where uh, we have left main occlusion, can happen with any valve in any situation, native valve, valve and valve. And this is the one that's uh, pretty scary. And uh, again, we have a better understanding now to prevent this and also to fix it if it does happen. And uh, again, uh, we know that uh, once it does happen, uh, the mortality rate is quite high. And uh, again, in the vivid registry with the valve and valve, you can see it's approximately 50% when you have this. And we've learned to help protect uh, this. You can see again in the literature, there's a lot of uh, examples of this. And just by looking at these, and we get accustomed to looking at angiography, we can see that there's not much room in there. So uh, again, these are, these are worrisome things. And again, when we look at the sinus, uh, we see how much room is actually going to be in there. We see a valve and then to, uh, to sort of estimate what a valve and valve will look like and get an idea, are we going to encroach on that left main or the RCA? We always talk about the left main, but the RCA is very important too, as many surgeons know when they come off pump with, uh, with uh, RCAs that are problematic. So predicting this is not always easy. And we do have a set of guidelines with impeccable CT imaging and looking at virtual uh, uh, sizing, uh, looking, trying to account for flaring of certain valves, trying to get, account for positioning. Uh, we get a sense of you know, which ones are going to be high risk. And there's a gradation. It's not yes or no. Often it's no problem, no protection. Others are, it may be a problem, no protection. And then we go down the line, protection, just in case. And the ones that we're very, very concerned about, I think we need to uh, discuss as a heart team, what is the best way to do that? Is the best way to proceed with protection, the best way to consider surgery, or maybe something else? And we'll talk about that something else in a second. Uh, risk factors for cornea obstruction, valve and valve, and we, again, we've seen them all. There's the anatomic risk factors. There's the bioprosthetic valve factors, because every valve is different, whether it's a TAVI valve or a surgically placed valve and also transcatheter valve factors. And again, that's one reason why we need to be, know our equipment. What we are putting in, we need to know both the strength and the limitations. And again, everything doesn't happen in isolation, they interact. So, is protection always, uh, always works? Uh, most of us in this room have done that. Most of us in this room have had to put in a stent uh, in the left main because uh, we were not happy, either a partial occlusion or a full occlusion. And most of the times we can stay out of trouble and it's not an issue. However, 
And there's different ways to do this. Uh, most of the times I don't put a stent in. I'll put a, if I need to protect, I'll put a, a stiff wire with a, a non-compliant balloon, um, unless I'm very, very concerned and there's no option for surgery or other options. But we have to be careful when we put stents in because trying to pull them out, we may strip the, the stent off. And even if we get a good result, does that result uh, last a long time? How do we treat that patient? Anticoagulation, dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, long, short, a lot of these patients are uh, frail. They don't, uh, they don't tolerate anticoagulation well. So these are things that we need to think about. And you can see we can have a patent stent, but uh, following them afterwards, there is issues often. And they can restenose, and treating these are very difficult. So, basilica procedure. Something that uh, uh, was brought up to uh, potentially treat patients with at high risk of um, left main occlusion, but patients maybe that are not surgical candidates. I think if patients are very good surgical candidates, we have to still think of that. And I'll show this here so everyone gets a sense of what that is. And again, um, we saw some of those images early on uh, where we go through the valve or the leaflet and uh, cauterize it essentially, uh, splaying it open. And uh, it may not look like it does anything initially, but with that opening and placing in the other valve, it provides uh, flow through the cage uh, and again, protects that left main. And it can be done bilaterally, it can be done into the RCA, it can be done just the RCA, uh, but it is an option. And this is what it looks like. And uh, pretty impressive when you actually see it that uh, this should work. Here's an example by uh, Danny Dwyer who uh, presented here last year. And you can see in a trifecta valve, going through with convienza or other type of stiff wire and still protecting the left main because there's still issues sometimes and basically snaring it and pulling it out and putting the valve in place and everything should work out fine but again still protecting it um, I think it takes a brave person still not to protect it and uh, happy with the flow and the patient did well I think in de novo valves if there's a concern about um, actually closing off the left main and the patient is a good surgical candidate, then we should think of surgery in these patients. And uh, yesterday's uh, talk, uh, using potentially sutureless or other type of valve, maybe just traditional uh, valve surgery, but if it's a higher risk patient, maybe sutureless, minimal technique, uh, we can go in and p potentially do it that way where they can uh, actually excise uh, the leaflets and put in this uh, valve. Uh, so this is a chance where, again, the heart team and individualizing therapy works. How about the mitral valve? Well, we know, uh, again, through the talks uh, earlier today, that uh, uh, mitral valve intervention is a bit more difficult in my mind and more complex than aortic valve interventions. And I do not do, other than balloon valvuloplasty, I don't uh, do mitral clip. But um, putting in new valves does cause, uh, you know, you're replacing one disease with another. And the one that we're worried about is LVOT obstruction, and that's an Achilles heel. So, an example of a complex procedure, and uh, everything looks good. Everyone pats themselves on the back. Here's the hemodynamics prior to this, and here's the hemodynamics after. And uh, really, this is um, just, uh, you can see here, even though it's atrial fib, uh, a Brockenbauer type sign uh, where you're, uh, you have uh, clearly you have uh, obstruction in the left uh, ventricular outflow tract and uh, it's, it's problematic. And there are modeling that can be done to assess whether or not the valve you put in will it affect this uh, LVOT. And uh, again, it's important not just looking in diastole but looking in systole. And when you actually look at mapping, you can see that the new LVOT is very small, and that's not a successful result. So uh, some people who were very brave and very smart decided to uh, try uh, different uh, approaches to this. And um, again, knowing that that leaflet, the anterior leaflet, is the cause of much of the problems. And it does have a hokum-like uh, physiologic uh, effect and can occlude uh, that uh, LVOT. So the lampoon procedure was thought out and a few people have done it and tried it and have been successful with it. But it is complex, it does take time. And I'll show you an animation of this as well. Again, getting the sense of this. And I'm hoping with the new um, mitral valve implants that are gonna be coming down the line that they'll have um, some type of solution to this because I think if we take um, 
putting in a percutaneous valve and then having to do this every time and then turning this into a five, six hour procedure, well, a surgeon can do a mini mitral much quicker, much more efficiently. So um, I, again, uh, these are the early days of this and I, uh, I do believe that things will get smoother and uh, not require uh, these uh, interventions. But for the time being, this is an intervention that you can see keeps the cages open and keeps the flow out. And LVOT, uh, LVOT obstruction, again, mostly by that uh, anterior leaflet, but also uh, the septum. Maybe that can be ablated afterwards, uh, an alcohol ablation. Or we can do surgery uh, with the transatrial resection, which was shown earlier today. So, uh, again, Lampoon does address many of these uh, issues. And there is... Uh, in the uh, at NIH and ID protocol underway, and hopefully uh, this will be used. And again, it's going to be used only by a few people initially, because it is complex, it does take time, and uh, not everyone will have the, the patience for this, that's for sure. So my take home message from uh, both of these techniques, the recent TAVR studies, again, are pushing us to a higher percentage of patients undergoing therapy, especially for valve and valve. We don't want to re -sternotomy. Lower risk patients, in my mind, have more to lose because these are the patients that, uh, actually, when you look at uh, partner three and the low risk um, uh, Medtronic studies, surgery does well. So we have to make sure that we are impeccable in how we do these patients to actually do better uh, for them. Pre-planning is, is important. And Basilica may help in certain patients, whether it's in native valve or in valve and valve. And there are promising, uh, looking at the mitral valve, promising techniques coming down the pipeline here, uh, which may require, um, you know, uh, techniques to prevent this neo-LVOT obstruction from occurring, and Lampoon may help here. But we need studies and we need more uh, improvements on the technique to make them easier and uh, more useful to more <coughs> patients. And this is a study, I, I wanted to show this. This is a patient that we had done uh, almost five years ago. And the reason I'm showing this, Costa, I showed this to the group here. Uh, this was the 29-year-old woman who was pregnant, and we did a valve and valve. No CT beforehand, just sort of taking a guess on, on what, to, what to do. Sorry about that. And we did a valve and valve on her because she wanted to maintain her pregnancy. And uh, knowing what I know now, I don't know if I would have been so uh, uh, cavalier as to do the procedure. And we ended up doing it. She did give birth, and it's almost four years ago. The child's doing well, and the patient's uh, gradients are still very acceptable. We do expect her to need a valve replacement, maybe a Ross procedure in the future. Uh, but um, uh, sometimes a little knowledge is, is a good thing when it works out, but not always. So I just want to show that just as follow-up uh, for the uh, attendees here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Excellent, uh, Dr. Valian. Uh, the next is uh, Dr.